On today's show, we are going to be talking about the mother-daughter relationship. Hello, I'm Shannon Skinner, and this is Extraordinary Women TV. My special guest today is Rona Maynard. She's an author, speaker, and former editor of Chatelaine Magazine. And wow, am I grateful to have her here today. Now, before you meet her, just to let you know later in the segment, before we take a break, I'll have my regular Good to Know Minute when I ask my guests for their top success tip. You're going to hear Rona's. Well, hello, Rona. Hi, Shannon. Great to be here. Oh, it's so nice having you here. And, you know, um, I'm so thrilled to meet you. Uh, you know, for the years that you'd worked with Chatelaine as the editor, uh, I knew your name. Um, I read the magazine. Um, I read you diligently. So it is such an honor for me to have you here. I hope you read me with pleasure, not just diligently. <laughs> no, I love the magazine. Well, I have to tell you, Shannon, that my favorite day of the month was always the day I wrote my editor's letter. And I wrote it picturing my readers and thinking of the letters that they had written, the drawings that they'd sent by their kids, the photos of their families. Women really shared their lives with me. So while I was writing, I was able to put a little of them into my head. Well, you know, if there's um, any woman in this country that really has her finger on the pulse of uh, women and their hearts and their desires, and their issues, uh, somebody who knows women very well in this country, it would be you. Would well, that be fair to you. say? I've worked at it. <laughs> now, you um, have been writing for a number of years. Um, you were born and raised in, in uh, the U.S. Um, to Canadian, uh, Canadian parents. And at some point along the line, you had a dream. You had an idea that you wanted to write some point something popped up into your mind and into your heart. Do you remember that moment? Well, I remember that I love telling stories to my class. I was a shy kid. I was terrible in gym. I did not get invited to very many birthday parties. I did not get a lot of Valentines. But when it was my turn to get up in front of the class and tell a story, everybody was mesmerized. So stories became how I related to other kids. And so in, in what way in terms of relating to them? Uh, was, it, it, was it, did you feel that you, you weren't able to connect with them? And, and I didn't know how to connect with wow. kids on, at recess on a, on a playground. I always did have a couple of friends, but my friends were were the weird kids. They were kids who were too tall, uh, who had a terminally ill parent, or their clothes didn't fit. There was, there was something about each one of those girls that made her self-conscious and different. And they were the only tribe that I had. But when I told a story, my tribe enlarged. And I could see everybody wondering what happens next. So did you feel them come close and sort of lean in their ears? Well, they were, in, they were in awe. Yeah. And I remember once when I was about 11, I was bullied at school by some bigger threatening girls. They saw me alone on the playground by myself and they came and they surrounded me and they just stared at me like this and they had linked arms like this. They, oh, I was so intimidated. But I didn't do ev anything. I, I just stood there with a stiff upper lip and I pretended it wasn't happening. And I went home and I told my mother what had happened. And I said that um, uh, tears had finally come down my cheeks. And, and, and she said, you're smarter than those girls go and entertain them, make them laugh. When they come back, and they will come back, put on a show, and the next day they came back. And I was in my element, I was telling stories, uh, they were funny stories, I was making them laugh, I was putting on a performance, and I thought, huh, I'm pretty good about this. And 
I, I couldn't wait for them to the next day for them to come back again and they did come back again and for maybe two or three days the girls came to see my show and then they didn't come back and I remember I felt stricken because all I had was the story all I had was the show I didn't really know how to relate to those girls as one person to another and I was not their friend. Really it was through my work as a journalist that I came to learn what it, what it takes to really listen to another woman, to hear her story in all its ragged and perplexing beauty. I would spend hours and hours with the phone at my ear interviewing women right across the country and I found that if I really listened people would tell me the most extraordinary personal things, deeply moving things about passages in their lives that had been hard, that had been transformative and often before we said goodbye they would say with a tone of wonderment you're the first person I've ever told about that and I started to realize there must be something special about my listening skills if I can do that. So um, your journey then uh, went from writing journalism in, to become an editor of Chatelaine which is really the magazine for women um, in this country. Uh, in this time and in, in the time of you listening and writing about women, I mean, was there one story that touched your heart more deeply than any other? Yes, there was. It, it concerned um, a young woman who lived in a very downtrodden part of, of the city. She had been abused as a child. She was a single mother. Nobody had ever modeled good parenting for this woman. I'm going to call her Sherry, although that wasn't her name. Sherry had a little boy she yelled at her little boy she didn't know how to look after him and children's aid was going to take her child away they told her she was an abusive parent but they were going to give her one chance uh, there was a uh, program that taught high-risk mothers games and nursery rhymes so that they could relate to their children with delight instead of trying to control them and Sherry went to the program she blossomed she had fun with her little boy as her parents had never had fun with her and she became such a star in in this community outreach program that they brought her in to work as a mentor to other parents I loved that story because I too had had difficulties as a mother. I suffered from depression when my son was born and I felt I was a terrible mother and I thought gee if somebody if I could have gone to that program I bet it would have been much better for me and my son but I didn't look like a quote high-risk mother and she did. So through my work as a journalist, I've discovered we're much more alike than we are different. And no matter what kinds of views two women have on the issues of the day, if you get them talking about the things and the people and the passages that formed them, there's going to be a lot of similarity. Now, um you had uh, a, a special relationship with your mother. Um, it is something that you write about in terms of it's really, uh, it really formed who you are today. Let's talk about your mom. Well, my mother was the most enchanting, funny, vivacious woman that I have ever known. But she was also the most controlling by a long shot. And she had her reasons. 
She was ferociously talented and smart. She was the first in her family to get a university education. She was in, the daughter of immigrants. She got Phi Beta Kappa, top honors of all the way, and she wanted to be a professor of English. She should have been. The doors were slammed in her face because she was a woman. Perhaps ahead of her time as well. She, she was, and she was a woman and she was also Jewish, and those, those two uh, were a bad combination. So she ended up married to an alcoholic husband in a small town. Her husband had a jo job teaching in a university, but his qualifications were not the equal of hers. She basically cleaned up after his messes, and the only thing that she thought she could do to excel in the, in the beginning was raise perfect children. So she poured a lot of effort into my sister and me. She subsequently cobbled together a new career as a writer, and she did marvelously in, in that. And she wrote for magazines all over the continent. She wrote a best-selling memoir that is still beloved in Canada called Raisins and Almonds. But it always rankled with her that she never got a job, never got an office, never got an assistant or her name on the door because she had earned all those things. She felt deprived. And I, on the other hand, was of the generation of women that flooded the workplace in the 70s. Opportunities were opening up as they never did for my mother's generation. It's not that we were smarter. It's not even necessarily that we were better educated, although a lot of us were. It was our timing. Our timing was better. And I think it was both thrilling and a little painful for women like my mother to see daughters getting what they could never have had through no fault of their own. I remember my mother coming to see me at the office in my first magazine job and uh, I said, and I introduced her to the office assistant and Karen and she said, oh, I would have liked a secretary. And I said, well, actually, Mom, Karen isn't my secretary, I, I share her. But I, her intention was so sad, really, in that, in that remark. She thought, I had none of those trappings. If you have trained for something and not been able to realize it, it hurts. The equivalent, I think, today would be immigrants who have established careers in another country and, and they come here and they can't work in their field. They have to drive a cab or something. So did that, you know, how did that affect your relationship then with your mother? Made it a little bit combative. Right. And when I poured myself into my career, my mother didn't like the way I was raising my son. She felt that I was neglectful, that I didn't have a proper sense of priorities, and she really was very hard on me. And I know I'm not imagining it, because after she died, I went through reams of her correspondence. She kept a carbon of every letter that she wrote. And I saw her expressing to other people, friends of hers, her qualms about me as a mother and how inadequate I was. And I think part of that came from what she perceived as a rejection of the kind of mother she had been. She did the Halloween costumes, homemade, uh, the dessert baked from scratch every day, the craft projects, hovering over her kids to make sure that they had every advantage, that they were expressing their talents to the fullest. And I was really offhand. And I think it did sting. But now I see young women 
women the age my, my daughter would be if I had one. And they say they wouldn't want to do what my generation did. They say, well, I don't want to come home cranky from the office at 7 o'clock and throw the burgers on the table and not have any emotional juice yes left for my kids. They say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave at 5 o'clock. So for me as a manager at Chatelaine, this was something I had to learn to deal with. And if I had a daughter like those woman, women, I'm sure I would have felt a little bit rejected. I would have thought, gee, honey, uh, if it wasn't for me and my generation, you wouldn't have some of the advantages that you enjoy today. You are standing on our shoulders. But because I had looked at my mother and me and the, the struggle that we had, I could see it through those younger women's eyes, and I knew I should not be hard on them. Now, Rona, we're um, just going to take a, a quick break, uh, and before we do, and I'd love to pick up to where we just left off, but before we do, I've got my Good to Know Minute, and I know you've got a fantastic success tip, so jump right in there. Know your greatest gift, that quality of yours that distinguishes you from everybody else out there. Buff it to a shine, and with each new job or assignment, ask yourself, how am I going to apply my defining talent? Well, that's good to know. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, more with Rona Maynard, author, speaker, former editor of Chatelaine Magazine. So stay where you are. Welcome back to the show. I'm Shannon Skinner, and I'm speaking with Rona Maynard, author, speaker, and former editor of Chatelaine Magazine. Um, now, you edited Chatelaine for a decade. I did. A yeah. wonderful, surprising, enchanting decade of change. Now, you left Chatelaine to write what is a fantastic memoir, My Mother's Daughter. Um, what was it in your heart that prompted you to want to write this story? Well, when I left, I didn't know I wanted to write it. I left just saying, I'm going to surprise myself. I thought 10 years was long enough at the helm of Chatelaine, and I went home, and it was so quiet. The quiet was just unearthly after the din of a big magazine. There was no ringing phone, no overflowing in tray. Suddenly, nothing was going to happen unless I made it happen, and I listened to the silence. And what I heard from the silence was the voices in my ear of all the Chatelaine readers who had responded to my editorials over the years. Their absolute favorite was the one I had written about the death of my mother and how it changed me. That appeared uh, right around Mother's Day early on in my Chatelaine years. I wanted to say something to all of us who don't have a mother still living, who are sad when we see mothers and daughters out for a Mother's Day lunch, who have nobody to buy roses for. And the floodgates opened when I wrote that, so I knew that I had a story to tell about my mother. I knew that I was, I became the woman I am today because of her, but also in spite of her. She really was the one who showed me, for good and ill and everything in between, what it means to be a woman. And when she died, I lost my North Star, which was both alarming and yet, in a way, wonderfully challenging, because I was free of all expectations. So it was freeing as well. Yes. And right. while my mother lay dying, she couldn't move or speak. She had a brain tumor. I said, and I don't know where the words came from, because it was a big, scary idea to me. You know, mother, 
I'm getting a little bored and I think I'd like to be the editor of Chatelaine someday and I was just sitting there holding her hand meditating out loud and my mother who had not moved in weeks squeezed my hand she was saying go for it five years passed before the job was actually mine I know she would have been so excited and proud anyway I I sat down at my computer and I'd never written anything uh, well I for 10 years I hadn't written anything longer than 800 words and I didn't know how I was going to do this but I started writing about her death and I just went from there the stories unspooled one story after another and I know from the feedback that I ha have had from all over the continent that other women are recognizing a little of themselves and their mother in our story even though on the outside their mother may have been nothing like mine how has writing this book impacted your life since well the fascinating thing about writing memoir is that you bring meaning to experience you truly understand what you have gone through that's what you have to understand it in order to write it and I found that as I write a, wrote about my mother I could see her I could hear her voice I could smell her perfume and I could also get inside her head I had to do that in order to tell the story I I had to ask myself well what would would have been going through her mind at the time that we had that big fight when I was 14 years old. And I found I was able to do it. So you learned a lot about your mother. I learned more about her. Mm. Just because someone is dead does not mean your relationship cannot continue to grow and deepen. And when a parent is not a larger than life figure blocking your view, you can go through the old correspondence, you can interview relatives, you can go through the photo album and really study those expressions and you'll see another side of your mother or father. Where is your book available? Is it, uh, uh, where can people buy it? They can buy it online, okay. they can go to a bookstore and if it's not on the shelf they I'm sure the store will order it for them or they can write to me at my website ronam at ronamaynard.com and I also sell hardcover signed copies. Now of course your readers wanted to know more about your relationship uh, with your, your, your mother, the Chatelaine readers. Um, there still is an opportunity through your website for women to share their stories of their relationship with their mother. Um, there's a lot through in, in that yes. story, the wonderful stories that I'm, are on your I'm, website. I'm very proud of that. My website has a mother-daughter gallery where women can post stories and photos about their mother or their daughter. and. I find that I'm now just getting inundated, which is wonderful, with stories from women who have just lost their mother and would like to remember her or just express their grief for her. I can tell from the way these, these um, posts are written that some of these women have a lot of trouble writing. It doesn't come naturally to them and it's a sign of how deeply they care and how much they need a forum that they have gone to the effort to post their story with me and I am so honored. And to express themselves. Yes. There are certain yeah, themes yeah. that come through many of these posts from women. Over and over they say, I didn't do enough for my mother when she was dying. I should have tried harder and then they will tell me about their life 
and these women have jobs, they have growing children, they have all kinds of demands on their time. Often they are the only sibling who was living near mom, so they were really trying to keep all kinds of things together. And just because one or two things they wish they had done differently, they fault themselves and they guilt themselves. And I say to all these women, you know, if your mother could be here, if she could come back just for one minute, she would tell you, dear, I don't want you to keep this guilt on yourself. You are a good daughter. You were there for me to the fullest extent that you could be. And that makes you the best daughter any woman could have. Women really do not want their daughters to suffer and feel guilty. Well, most of them don't. I guess there are a few out there, but you know, even some very difficult mothers soften at the end and they start to become loving. You, wow, this is really, really inspiring. So for people who, uh, any of the viewers want to go and read uh, more about you and read uh, some of these stories in your gallery, uh, they can go to RonaMaynard.com. Uh, Rona I'd be delighted. Mm. And a lot of my old Chatelaine columns are there too, plus some more recent blog posts, many of them. Now, you... Um, uh, also do these days you're, you're putting on some uh, seminars for other women uh, to learn how to write memoirs themselves? That's right. It's mm -hmm. a one-day intensive memoir workshop for yeah. women. I do it in Toronto, about five of them a year. And most of the women who come, and this is by design, are not writers. They are women who've been very busy doing other things, running a business, doing a job, raising kids, whatever. They've been very good at what they do, and they've reached the stage in life where they want to reflect and ask themselves, gee, how did I get here? How did I become me? So I challenge them to tell one story from their life. We share them online before we meet and it's a very small group, anywhere from three to eight women, and I guide each one to the heart of her own story by asking the kinds of questions that I asked for so many years as a journalist. If you ask questions, if you listen, if you keep an open mind, the real story will reveal itself, and there always is one. Women tell themselves, oh, who cares about me? I'm just an average woman. I'm not Kate Middleton, I'm not Whitney Houston, but we do care about the stories of women like ourselves because each story is a doorway onto our own story and we recognize a little of ourselves. So I have seen it happen time and again in my workshop that somebody will say, that happened to my sister or that happened to my best friend, or even that happened to me. We feel less alone when we share our stories. And um, I'm gonna get a chance to hear some of uh, your storytelling um, at an event coming up very, very soon. Um, May 4th, you will be speaking at the Ignite and Connect event hosted by Positive Fabulous Women. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing you talk. What are you going to be talking about? My speech is called Renew, Recharge, Reimagine, Tap Your Inner Wellspring. And it is about that place within yourself where all your strengths live, your creativity, your caring, your wisdom. How can you prevent it? from being run dry by all the demands that you face as a busy woman today. There are things that drain it and things that replenish it. So we're going to talk at Ignite and Connect about the replenishment and there are sources all around us. What would be the number one source? I gotta know. Well, 
Inspiration is everywhere, everywhere. I remember being inspired in a checkout line once by a gesture of kindness shown to a frazzled new cashier at the front of the line. Everybody was so impatient and they were really mad at, at this poor woman. And one woman at the front of the line said, it's okay, hon. We've all been new some time or another and we all know how it feels. Now, I was new at Chatelaine when she said that. But thanks to one brave soul, I remembered how it felt to be new. Keep your eyes open. Don't think it's just going to be some business mentor who is going to open up the world for you. It might be somebody you never see again who will give you an insight that will always stay with you and change the way you approach other people. Well, Rona, we've uh, unfortunately um, have run out of time, but I have really enjoyed uh, this time with you. and. Uh, uh, I am really looking forward to hearing you speak at the Ignite and Connect uh, event uh, hosted by Positive Fabulous Women and Katya Miller and her fantastic team of people uh, that have pulled this event together. And of course, Extraordinary Women TV um, is a proud media partner. So I'm happy to uh, be able to be part of being able to uh, bring this event to women uh, solopreneurs in, in Toronto. So again, looking forward to seeing you. Come on out. We definitely want you to come on out. Anything, anything you'd like to add? I'm looking forward to s igniting and connecting on May the 4th and to reading those stories from women who want to share their mother's legacy. Well, thank you, Rona. Well, for more information about uh, Rona Maynard um, and this interview, you can visit the website at extraordinarywomentv.com. And for more information about upcoming shows, past guests, uh, more detailed information about the show, you can find out again at the URL is extraordinarywomentv.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and there are a lot of places to connect with me. Well, if you are interested in transforming your life, I hope these stories have inspired you. You've been watching Extraordinary Women TV. I'm Shannon Skinner. See you soon.